Fitness, which you should all go and subscribe to right now if you don't already. Every day what we do is we take a big story in the news and we break it down inside this podcast so that the story makes more sense instead of just dashing by on your Twitter feed. So today in this Twitter Spaces event, we're going to talk about the huge infrastructure bill that's making its way through the Senate right now. It's something like 2,700 pages of proposed spending on roads, trains, broadband, electricity. It's taken weeks and weeks and weeks for Republicans and Democrats to negotiate even this far. And we're also going to be talking about some new steps just announced from the White House to introduce new standards on automobile fuel efficiency and emissions, including an executive order that sets a goal of half of all new car sales being electric car sales by 2030. So all of this stuff is related. The Biden administration is hoping that the infrastructure spending in the right places will have the effect of curbing carbon emissions and limiting the impact of climate change. And to talk about all of this, we're joined by both the U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, and the Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, Michael Regan. Welcome to both of you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Glad to be with you. (laughs) Thanks for being with us. And also, just a note to the audience, I want to say to anyone listening right now that We're hoping to air an edited form of this conversation on All Things Considered and on the Consider This podcast. So by entering this room and asking a question, you do technically give your consent to be on air on NPR. Not sure if that's something that appeals to you, but keep that in mind before you ask a question. And to ask a question, please select the request to speak mic that's at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. We'll be sure to get to your question. We'll do our best. A reminder to all of you who may want to ask a question to please stay on topic. And of course, any attacks or trolling does mean that you will get muted and removed from the room. Sorry, but that's how it is. All right, Secretary Buttigieg and EPA Administrator Regan, thanks again for joining us. Um, let's just talk about the infrastructure bill first and its environmental impact. It was meant to be like this massive climate change initiative. Can one of you just lay out real quick for us how spending on things like transit, railroads, hydrogen, and carbon capture, explain how all of that will help build a world with less climate change? Well, I'll I'll start. Uh, uh, So from a transportation perspective, we're mindful of the fact that uh, within the economy, the single sector that contributes the most greenhouse gases is transportation. And that means that that any decision about transportation is a decision about climate, whether we recognize it or not. We very much recognize that in this administration, and it's been part of the vision for the president's jobs plan from the beginning. Uh, that's true in terms of the funding for electric vehicle charging stations so that we can make it easier to adopt electric vehicles. Yeah, it's true when you look at things like like the commitment to public transit, the largest uh, ever uh, from the federal government, because uh, the more we create good options for people to use transit, uh, the more we can divert what would otherwise be trips in uh, uh, cars on the road. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's why we're trying to make sure transit itself is greener, making it easier uh, by providing direct funding for transit authorities to, for example, acquire electric buses that have zero emissions. And the other thing I would mention about this is that we, we view this really is the space to prove out the president's vision that uh, the the old framework of climate versus jobs is is just a false choice and actually one of the best ways we can create jobs for the future is to supercharge america's leadership in confronting climate change and capture the jobs that are associated with that work uh, rather than allowing america to keep falling behind Well, let me ask you, because President Biden's vision on how to slow down climate change has been a very, very ambitious vision. But obviously, this bill that's currently before the Senate has taken weeks and weeks and weeks to get a bipartisan deal on it. You know, obviously, there had to be compromises. And I want to ask both of you, I'd love to hear from both of you on this particular question. What did you regret seeing Democrats give up to make a deal possible? Michael Regan, do you want to start? You know, I, I think that there, there right now are no regrets in terms of this is a historic investment, historic opportunity. And yes, there are always multiple sides that want to advocate for more or less. 
But I think we have to keep our eyes on on the the prize here. And I couldn't agree with Secretary <clears throat> Buttigieg more in terms of the mitigation, but there are also climate resilient aspects to the bipartisan infrastructure uh, you know, deal as well. And when we think about the largest investments in history in our nation's drinking water and wastewater infrastructure, that too has an element of building back better, but also thinking about not building back the way things were, but more prepared in a climate resilient manner. And so what I would say is uh, that we're very proud of the progress and the historic investments that the president has proposed. And we think that we're headed in the right direction. But again, Administrator Regan, what did you regret seeing Democrats give up in order to make this current deal possible on infrastructure? Can you just be specific about something that you wish was going to be in this bill, but is not going to be? You know, I, I think what we were aiming for to be in this bill uh, is still in the bill. Uh, they may not be at the scale uh, of the president's original vision. Uh, but again, we are trending in the right direction uh, to make the historic investments uh, that the president has intended. Okay, let me turn to you, Secretary Buttigieg. Uh, according to Regan, everything that you guys ever dreamed of is in this bill, but just not as much as you wanted. Is that how you would characterize it? Or is there something that's missing from this bill that you would have liked to see had you guys been able to be as ambitious as President Biden was going into this? Well, if, if you look across the transportation categories, obviously it varies from one line item to the next, but basically we're coming in around two thirds of what the president originally proposed, uh, which is why, you know, we continue to be on an order of magnitude here that is historic, uh, in many ways, era defining. Of course, it's not the last or the only word on provisions that are going to make a big difference for our climate. Uh, you know, certainly as we see the budget resolution, the, the next package, right, the, the other half basically of the president's economic vision, we're going to see provisions in there uh, that uh, I know will have an impact on the climate too. But uh, we're enthusiastic about what emerged here because, uh, again, this is the bulk of what the president put forward. And what the president put forward is historic in its dimensions. Well, let's turn now to these new announcements from the president. Uh, we're talking about stricter fuel efficiency and emission standards for cars. It rolls back the previous administration's targets. I also understand that some of this is based on a deal that California made with some automakers to voluntarily adopt something like 3.7% annual improvements in fuel economy and emission standards for the next few years. Let me ask you, 3.7%, and that's kind of the range of annual improvements we're going for. Is that really enough to significantly slow down climate change? Well, I think when we look at, uh, number one, the, the president today will sign an executive order that sets an ambitious new target uh, to make half of all new vehicles sold in 2030, um, you know, zero emission vehicles. And so this is the big, bold vision and the direction we are headed in. You're correct that the president also asked EPA to take a look at the uh, previous administration's rollbacks that were occurring. And what we're proposing or will propose will be, uh, you know, a, a more stringent approach based on sound science and the technologies available to reduce the emissions at the rate uh, that we need to for vehicles 2023 through 2026. And then beyond, we see a more ambitious uh, goal that the president has set for all of us. Okay. And from the transportation yes. side, let me be clear, uh -huh. we're, we're building to uh, an 8% standard of improvement. So it, it doesn't take long before the math gets convoluted because there's the uh, uh, there's this framework that, that was driven by California that that's uh, uh, basically in effect for the, the immediate model years here. But we are upping the ambition in a big way. And let me also mention that it's actually a big deal for DOT and EPA, uh, as we are not just on this on this call, but in this administration, to have the alignment that we do. Uh, sometimes that the, there has actually been daylight, or, or that you know within an administration, they've they've been even pitted against each other sometimes. And what you see here is a shared vision that comes directly from the president, where uh, the EPA under administrator Regan's leadership is using their authorities, and we're using ours all to build toward uh, a vision that is ambitious both economically and with regard to our climate. 
Okay, well, I want to also talk about the electric vehicle goal here. We're talking about half of all new car sales being electric car sales by 2030. I mean, right now, electric car sales are generally more expensive than gas cars. They're less available. How do you plan to persuade people to buy more expensive cars in just the next few years? Well, first of all, they've got to get less expensive. And part of how you do that is through economies of scale. So by driving the kinds of improvements that these standards encourage, uh, that leads to these vehicles becoming less and less expensive. And I think uh, over time, eventually uh, uh, becoming a, a clear financial winner. Uh, you add to that the fact of the fuel savings. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're already approaching a point where, depending on the vehicle, depending on your driving patterns, you're, you're going to be capturing an economic benefit. Uh, another area, of course, is to make them less expensive. That's what the tax credits have done historically, and, and that's an area for future policy. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the last thing I'll mention is that, of course, we're doing our part on the policy level, but uh, it will also be up to the makers of these cars, companies that have a product to sell, um, to communicate why they are superior and get people to test drive them. And I'll tell you, when, when people drive these things, uh, they, they pretty much always come away wowed by their capabilities. The, these should not be a luxury item. Going exactly. The exactly. These need to be and the norm. Exactly. And as to the historic tax credits that people have been able to enjoy when they buy electric vehicles, I mean, what are we talking about here? Because in my experience, it's not like so much money that it really actually makes the car that much cheaper. Do you know what I'm saying? So what kind of tax credits are you guys envisioning for the future? Well, look, the, the $7,500 uh, historically has, has obviously made a big difference. And this is a, a subject of, of live conversation right now in the Senate and in, in the House as, uh, as they frame up uh, what policy is going to be going into the future. Uh, again, a, a lot of this is about getting through the transition of the next few years and accelerating it. So there is no doubt in my mind that the time will come relatively soon where the, these vehicles uh, more than pencil out and, and you're saving money by buying one. But the relatively soon isn't necessarily good enough because we are in an absolute race against time where the deadlines are being set, not by Congress, but by, by the physics of this planet, right. uh, where we have got to make sure uh, that we accelerate the curve for the sake of our climate. And in a world that's probably moving toward EVs no matter what, there's an economic competitiveness imperative to make sure that uh, we act so that that EV revolution is made in America, on American soil, by American workers. Well, it's not only going to take lots and lots of electric vehicles. We have to lower emissions across the grid to get any meaningful change on climate change. So I want to ask you, there's been a lot of criticism, particularly from environmental activists, that this infrastructure bill, if I can pivot back to the bill, that this bill is a little too much status quo, meaning it invests in existing infrastructure, in fossil fuel industries, for example. How fair of a criticism is that, you think, that this bill is more about maintaining the world as it is rather than moving into a truly new one? Either of you can take this question. Anyone? <laughs> give I'll me let the, the administrator defense. jump. Give me, yeah, give me the defense. Why, why is the infrastructure bill moving our country and the rest of the world into a new climate regime, if you will? A lot of people out there say this is about continuing to invest in the existing infrastructure we have, including in fossil fuel industries. How fair is that? Hey, I, you know, I, I would say that we have to stay focused on the fact that these investments are historic. When we look at the largest federal investments in public transit, EV charging, electric school buses, reducing emissions near airports, ports, waterways, making our water infrastructure more resilient to the climate change that we are seeing and feeling right now, we're talking about billions and billions of dollars in investment and mitigation practices to reduce climate change pollution. But also we're talking about shoring up our infrastructure in a way that is more resilient to the climate impacts that we know we are facing today and we'll see in the foreseeable future. And we cannot lose sight that these investments will also create millions of jobs. Uh, this, these are historic investments, and you know we really have to stay focused on these historic investments will better prepare us 
for where we are today with these climate impacts, as well as mitigation. I'll also cite that, uh, you know, Secretary Buttigieg alluded to this earlier. Uh, this is one of the tools in the president's toolbox. Uh, we have regulatory and statutory authority within all of our agencies to pursue aggressive climate goals. Uh, we have the bipartisan infrastructure deal uh, that is being hammered out right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, a budget process. Uh, I can speak for EPA to say that the, the, the budget requested by the president for EPA is uh, over a 20 percent increase in the budget that we had in the preceding year. Those resources will also be put towards climate mitigation as well as adaptation. So these are historic investments. Uh, when the president pledged to build back better, uh, I would say that he has not uh, backed off of his ambitious climate and air quality and environmental justice agenda. And we're excited to see his leadership in these areas. Can I ask about, you know, um, there's money in this bill for so-called power infrastructure, like transmission lines, and the idea is to expand wind and solar power and put it where it's needed. But how optimistic are you that that can happen, given that state and local governments might push back on projects like that? Do you see any obstacles there? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely optimistic when I've looked at the plans that the Department of Energy has, the stakeholder engagement processes. You know, we need these new investments in uh, an advanced grid that not only facilitates cleaner renewable energy, but also increases the efficiency by which we transmit these electrons. There are lots of inefficiencies in the wires and the current grid. And we're talking about capturing with new and advanced technologies, new investments, a more efficient grid, just as much as we're talking about the facilitation of new, greener, cleaner energies. Uh, we have to really develop our state, our regional, our local and federal partnerships uh, but that's what rowing in the same direction is all about. And that's what this administration is investing in. OK, I want to make sure that we have some time for audience questions. So I hear that they are piling up as we speak. Let's go ahead to one listener right now. I'm going to go and call on Keith. Keith, take it away. What is your question? Good morning. Thank you so much for taking my question. Secretary Buttigieg, I serve on the Indianapolis City County Council, and one of the most frequent constituent services requests that I get is just to fix the darn roads. So having uh, had the experience of Indiana municipal government, and now in your new position as Secretary of Transportation with this infrastructure bill, could you speak to how that's going to help us at the local level to fix the roads? Thanks so much. Absolutely. And, and thanks for, for what you do. And in, in, as, as you know, my, it warms my mayoral heart when I'm talking to <laughs> folks who are at the cutting edge of, uh, um, of local leadership. And as you know, you know, th these are very personal issues for people because because it affects whether you're able to get to school, get to work, get around. Uh, not to mention the fact that, that a lot of Americans are paying what we call an invisible pothole tax, which is basically uh, what it already costs you. Uh, to drive on roads that are substandard in terms of the damage to cars. Um, it's one of the reasons why it's, uh, it's so important to have the funding here, over $100 billion for roads and bridges and major projects. And these need to go out to the communities like yours, where leaders like you are ready to put them to work. I bet you have a list uh, uh, an arm's length long, as just about every local leader I talk to does, of things you would love to do tomorrow if there were just more funding. Uh, a, a lot of uh, local and state governments have stepped up, but Washington hasn't been doing its part enough in terms of providing that kind of funding. And so, you know, there are a lot of really exciting, compelling, futuristic things in this vision, but we also got to take care of the basics, uh, repairing roads that are in need of repair, repairing bridges that could have to be taken out of surface for safety reasons if we don't look after them. And of course, making sure that when we do repair or improve, that we're doing it with the view to the future and not the past. Some of these resilience measures that Administrator Regan was talking about, uh, because of course, uh, the right answer for how a road ought to look for the next 50 years, especially in the context of climate change is going to be different than how it looked for the last 50 years in a lot of places. All right. The next person up is Nancy. Nancy, go ahead. You have the floor. Nancy? Oh, okay. Oh, is that Nancy? 
Yes, hi. Yeah, hi, go right ahead. Oh, thank you so much. My question is regarding the Justice 40 initiative. I work with a group of cities in Southeast, Southeast Los Angeles County totaling 2 million residents. We're an area of historic disinvestment that's been hit hard by the pandemic. But we are anticipating two new rail transit lines beginning construction in the next couple of years. We also have a need and a plan for zero emission trucks on a major freeway that serves the port complex of Long Beach in LA and impacts our neighborhoods now with pollution. And we're developing a local broadband plan to close our digital divide. I hope that the administration will work with us to help achieve these goals in the near term. And I'd like to ask each of the secretaries to please speak about how the Justice 40 program will be rolled out and what we can expect in the way of partnership. Thank you. Well, you know, I'll, I'll start and I'll, I'll say one of the things that I've really enjoyed about my partnership with Secretary Buttigieg is he's seen the change on the ground with the local communities as a mayor. I served as a secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality in North Carolina and have seen these issues from a state perspective. And so we understand that things have to get done on the ground. And that's what we've encouraged our staff to do. You know, this administration has made racial equity, environmental justice and equity issues a centerpiece of the administration's portfolio. And at EPA, we've made EJ part of our DNA. And one of the things that we're learning here is how much energy both of our departments are putting towards environmental justice, equity, and inclusion. And so when we look at the president's Justice 40 initiative, not only are we coupling the environmental justice and equity issues that we're tackling through our agency, but the Justice 40 initiative ensures that these historic investments from the bipartisan infrastructure deal, uh, from the American Rescue Plan and other areas will ensure that 40% of the investments made in these communities, especially those who have been disproportionately impacted for generations, 40% of those investments will remain within those communities. That speaks to not only reducing pollution, protecting public health, but economic development and job growth. And that's why I'm excited to partner with Secretary Buttigieg and others in this administration on the Justice 40 initiative, equity and inclusion issues. We believe that we can protect the environment, protect public health, grow the economy and grow jobs all in one. But if I may take a specific piece of what Nancy just asked, I mean, what is this administration doing to make mass transit walking and biking more realistic options for Americans? Well, this is a very important element of, uh, of what's in this infrastructure plan, but also, uh, you know, even before that passes, something we've been working on from day one, uh, when uh, my department released, uh, for example, the call for applications for a, a grant program of nearly a billion dollars, uh, I made clear for the first time that we were going to ex be explicitly reviewing the equity implications and climate implications of these different proposals. It can be something as simple as introducing a way to make it safer or easier. To, to get around as a pedestrian or, or a cyclist, uh, or to, to take uh, one of Nancy's examples from the area around the, the port of Long Beach, uh, you know, uh, uh, electrifying the vehicles coming in and out of a port, for example, is actually something that has a lot of uh, justice implications because it's disproportionately communities of color that live near those ports where kids are subject to the particulate matter that is in the air and, and have disproportionate rates of asthma. Uh, so uh, these issues are so closely intertwined. It's why I'm enthusiastic about the partnership that uh, uh, the Administrator Regan was, uh, was describing. And you know, this is an area where we see a lot of opportunity through, uh, yes, what's in this bill, but, uh, but also just as a matter of day-to-day -day policy, paying attention with the knowledge that sometimes in the past, federal infrastructure dollars have, frankly, contributed to injustice. Uh, but, but we can take that knowledge, not in the spirit of, of, of guilt, but in the spirit of needing to fix what was broken and put it to work in the decisions we make going forward. All right. Suzanne, you are up next. Suzanne, go ahead and ask your question. She's connecting. Suzanne? Hello. Hi. Hi. This is, hi how are you? Good. Okay. Good. 
Thank you for taking my question. Um, uh, in the infrastructure bill, it feels that putting resources toward resiliency is fantastic, but preventing um, the problem seems that it was it would be even more important. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg, do you think that there will be a price on carbon in the reconciliation package that's a part of this infrastructure bill? And if there is a price on carbon, it feels like there are a lot of bills in Congress as we speak that also include a dividend that would be returned to help the most vulnerable, lower income people. And it would truly get us away from fossil fuels. What are your thoughts on that? Thanks. So, so this is an idea that, that I think is getting more and, and more attention and interest, uh, different versions of it being taken up in, in different countries. And uh, I, I can't speak to what's around the corner with, with the resolution with us still uh, more focused on the, the bipartisan infrastructure uh, plan. But uh, to how you open the question, uh, I think it's really important to recognize that, uh, yes, we're, we're dealing with what's already upon us in terms of what's al- the, the effects of, of, of climate change. You see it very concretely impacting transit and transportation systems from, uh, you know, roads getting washed out to uh, the, the non-availability of I-70 right now in Colorado in the wake of mudslides uh, to uh, Portland having to take their transit system offline because the uh, cables were literally at risk of melting in triple digit heat that is not even supposed to be possible in that part of the U.S. So, yes, there's a resilience. But as your question correctly uh, puts forward, we've also got to be doing our part to prevent it from getting any worse than it has to. And there are a lot of different mechanisms that can help make that possible in our energy policy, in our tax policy, many of which I know will come up in this budget resolution debate that's ahead. Uh, in the meantime, w- what I know for sure is that the very specific funding and specific policies in this bipartisan infrastructure plan are unquestionably part of the solution and and uh, a part that, that shouldn't be overlooked. All right. I want to go now to, I don't know exactly how to pronounce the name, but it looks like Chaitu, Chaitu or Chaitu, C-H-A-I-T-U. Chaitu, go ahead and ask your question. Hey, thank you for giving me the time to speak. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was going to ask, since uh, Elon Musk has already provided the solution in terms of making everything solar, all power source, maybe. And also I saw the update that you're looking to convert buses to electric. Converting our power grid would probably alleviate any or uh, any power demands on our, uh, or uh, how to put it, let's say, ill effects of uh, um, power generation on climate. So could we go toward that uh, solar generation solution? Curious for Michael's view on this, I'll just say very briefly, we're mindful that EVs are only as clean as the energy going into them. And it's one of the reasons why we're paying so much attention to the grid. But I know the administrator's got a lot of expertise on this. Well, I think I I agree with that. I think when we look at where we are with uh, battery technology, whether that be via vehicles or storage, uh, we're trending in the right directions. And listen, our, our goal is to really focus on where technology can take us and how quickly we can get there. And we know that through the bipartisan infrastructure deal, we need to see these massive historic investments into modernizing our grid so that we can plug and play with the advanced battery technology and connect to good, renewable, clean energy. But make no mistake, uh, as agencies, we still have regulatory authority that we bring to the table as we think about how we get the deep emission emission reductions we need from sources like uh, natural gas. Uh, You know, EPA is looking at a proposed rulemaking for both new and existing sources to cut methane emissions. Uh, We are taking a very close look at and engaging with our stakeholders on how to further reduce pollution from power plants. Uh, We propose rulemakings to eliminate hydrofluorocarbons in our our market system. So there are so many things that we're doing in concert with the bipartisan infrastructure deal. It's really an all hands on deck approach. And I agree 
with the premise of the question, which is how do we leverage all available technologies to reduce these emissions? And through the bipartisan infrastructure deal, the American Rescue Plan, the president's budget request, and the statutory authority that has been bestowed upon our agencies, uh, we're using an all of the above strategy. Well, our time is winding down, but I want to wrap with one last question, a bit of a philosophical question for, for both of you or either of you. Um, you know, so much of environmentalism in the past decades was about stopping things from getting built, right? Like making sure that construction didn't hurt the environment. But now it feels like we're in this new era where dealing with climate change is actually about building new stuff. And I'm curious, do you think the environmental activist community, the environmental community, is making that shift with you and going along with policies and proposals like the ones we've been talking about today to build more stuff. What do you, what do you guys think? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take that and then turn it over to Secretary Buttigieg. But I, I believe because of the president's direction to have robust stakeholder engagement, uh, we are continually engaging not just with the environmental community, but the environmental justice community and others as well. And what they're really looking for is a seat at the table. Historically, uh, the, the business community and others have always dominated the stakeholder process. Uh, what we're looking at is an opportunity to use the power of convening and bring communities to the table, our environmental stakeholders to the table and allow for them to have an equal opportunity to talk through permitting processes and other processes. So I believe that we can find efficiencies in the system, bringing all people to the table so that we can build and invest in the infrastructure that the president is promoting. Secretary Buttigieg, last words. Yeah, I, I love this question and I love this thought. I, I think the way forward is about adding and subtracting. It, it's the, the core of the president's vision to, to literally build back better. Uh, sometimes that, that means removing things that, uh, uh, that, that caused harm, like uh, um, the, a highway that was deliberately routed straight through a black neighborhood in a way that, that tore it apart. Um, other times it means adding something new and, and building something new. You know, uh, uh, the electric vehicles that we're discussing today is a great example of that. Uh, right. It, it, it's not about uh, an end to cars. Far from it. It's about a new chapter in uh, American industry, but one that can create jobs on terms that are more beneficial for the environment. And I do think that's a that's a transformation that is happening right now. It's not about saying. Uh, no to, to things. It's about the, the right combination of yeses yes. and nos of adding and subtracting that is empowering for people who've been left out in the past and that is positioning America to truly lead the world in uh, what it actually looks like to have a sustainable climate forward economy. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg and EPA Administrator Michael Regan, thank you very much to both of you for spending so much time with us today. Great to be with you. Thank you. That was great. All right. Well, that concludes our Twitter Spaces chat event. Thanks to all of you for attending. I hear we have like more than a thousand people in this room. So that's awesome. Thank you to all of you. And we hope to see you back for our next Twitter chat event.